Well, good afternoon to all participants. I would like to welcome you to the second annual USDA Virginia State University Zoom informational meeting. We have several USDA agencies and other agencies involved today, and they have a lot of information they would like to share. Questions will be at the end. At this time, I would like to say welcome again to the Zoom meeting. And we're going to turn it over to Michael, Mark Klinsman that's over the Zoom slides. And at the end of each slide, if you would just say next slide, please, we will continue on from there. Thank you very much for attending this Zoom session. Once again, welcome. Good morning, everybody. This is Joe Boatwright at USDA Rural Development. Uh, I'm honored to present this uh, slideshow to you today. Uh, Mark, if you could go to the next slide, please. And you can go to the following slide, too. Next slide. Uh, rural Development has three branches. Uh, the Rural Business Cooperative Service is what we're going to talk about today. We have a Rural Housing Service and also a Rural Utility Service to help rural America. Next slide, please. For everybody, this is our uh, website where you can get all of our USDA programs for further information. Next slide, please. And we have a couple different ways we help ag producers, uh, partners with ag. Mark, next slide, please. One of them is we help with a value added producer grant. This is where somebody is changing the state of an ag product strawberries in the jam, milk in the cheese. Uh, we, it is a grant program, marketing grant. Next slide, please. And who's eligible? Next slide. Uh, independent producers, ag producer groups, farmers or ranchers, majority control producers based in business ventures. Next slide, please and how the funds may be used. Next slide. Uh, working capital expenses, which would cover all your operating costs uh, and different marketing expenses. Next slide, please. Planning activities. Next slide. The next program we'll talk about is our Rural Energy for America program. This is uh, next slide, Mark. And these are grants and loans are available for installing renewable energy systems and for energy efficient items. Next slide, please. Who's eligible? Next slide. Uh, they're ag producers. Next slide. And small rural businesses based on a SBA definition of small business. Next slide, please. Energy efficient eligible projects are lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, fans, automatic controls, insulation. Next slide. Renewable energy eligible costs are solar, wind, small hydro, uh, hydroelectrical units, anaerobic digesters, biomass units, geothermal units, or wave or ocean power. Next slide, please. Then this year we have, for the COVID-19 uh, virus, we have the BNI CARES Act program, which was just enacted a few months ago to help uh, businesses as well as some of the money is for ag producers. Next slide, please. If anybody knows about a regular BNI program, we can do anything to help businesses. It does not necessarily have to be small businesses. We can uh, produce land, make operating loans, buy equipment. However, uh, the funds need to be, and the CARES Act is a shoot off of that program. Next slide, please. Typical loans include purchase and development of land and buildings, equipment, machinery, and supplies in our regular program. 
in the BNI's CARES Act program, there's a few modification and loan proceeds are limited to working capital purposes only. Next slide, please. Eligible borrowers include for-profit businesses, nonprofits, cooperatives, federally recognized tribes, and public bodies. Next slide, please. Lenders need the legal authority to financial strength to sufficiently experience operating a, su uh, a successful lending program. And we have federal uh, pre-approved lenders, which are federal and state chartered banks, savings and loans, farm credit, and uh, some credit unions. Next slide, please. And the overview of the BNI CARES Act. Next slide, please. We have approximately 20 and a half million, uh, uh, million dollars in program level, which based on the guarantee, the way we guarantee it with the bank, which the bank is their lender, it comes up to about a billion dollars we have for this program. And it's available through September 30th, 2021, which is our next fiscal year. And the notice was uh, put out to the public on May the 22nd, 2020. Next slide, please. The purposes for the loan, are, uh, it has some limited purposes. It's working capital only, which includes payroll cost, health care benefits, salaries, principal and interest payments, rents, leases, utilities, inventory, and supplies. Where this difference differs from our uh, regular BNI program, it has a 90% guarantee on any loss that the lender would have. It has a 2% guarantee fee. And it has ex uh, been expanded to include ag production, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The modified terms in our regular program, working capital loans are seven years. In the CARES Act program, they're gonna be 10 years with the first year being a complete deferral of principal and interest and then uh, you have the principal only the next two years. And it's for capital and equity requirements. Collateral discounting by the lender is not required like in our normal program. And the maximum loan amount is $25 million. Next slide, please. As I said, it's maximum loan is 10 years. Uh, loan principal and interest may be deferred for up to three years from the loan closing. Interest payments may be deferred up to one year from loan closing. And the eligible loan purposes include uh, payroll costs, health benefits, salaries, principal and interest, rent leases, and the big thing is inventory, which helps a lot, and supplies. Next slide, please. I did say it was a 90% guarantee with a 2% guarantee fee. And then we have a half a percent annual renewal fee, which is paid on the unpaid principal balance as of December 31st every year. And, and this fee is technically a lender fee, but it's usually passed on to the borrower. And most of the time it is included in the interest rate so the borrower does not see it because it's a bank fee. Ne next slide, please. Agricultural producers are eligible bars with certain conditions. Uh, as long as they do not qualify for FSA funds, Farm Service Agency funds, they are eligible for the funds for this program. So if they're meeting either what they want is not eligible for a Farm Service Agency or they're at the cap of the debt for Farm Service Agency, they can come through rural development for these funds. Next slide, please. Loans must be to cover costs to prevent, prepare, and respond to the, uh, to the pandemic. Loans for working capital support agricultural production include independent agricultural production or eligible at the applicant's loan request 
exceed the FSA guaranteed loan authority or if the applicant's request is otherwise ineligible for FSA loans. Next slide, please. Administrative expenses and administrative service contracts, property insurance, hazard insurance, and other business insurance can be included. Principal and interest payments on existing loans during the pandemic recovery, excluding owner stock or debt or related party debts. And I've already discussed the rent payments on the leases. Next slide, please. Okay, for your ag producers, expenses including inventory, feed, fertilizer, seed, and chemicals, livestock, excluding livestock for breeding and supplies. Marketing, shipping, shipping, and other expenses incurred through the normal business operations or such additional expenses due to the national COVID-19 public health emergency. Loan costs and essential loan uh, related expenses can also be included in the loan. Next slide, please. Things that are not eligible, uh, any type of business acquisitions, purchases of land, equipment, construction, refinancing, unless such debt refinancing is for debt subject to February 15th for eligible purposes. Uh, or ineligible purposes or entity types. Next slide, please. Loans to one borrower include the guaranteed or unguaranteed portions of the outstanding principal and interest balance for any existing BNI guaranteed loans and the loans cannot exceed $25 million. Loans shall be based on cash flow analysis and must be greater than the amount needed to cure the problems on the pandemic. Next slide, please. The maximum loan amount of the CARES Act program for working capital purpose may not exceed 12 times the borrower's total average monthly cost of eligible working capital loan purposes less than the total amount SBA uh, that you receive on the PPP program. Borrowers receiving BNI CARES Act program loans in an amount less than the maximum eligible uh, in accordance with the above paragraph may apply for subsequent loans until the money is spent. Next slide, please, Mark. So if you look and, and if somebody had a thousand dollars worth of a um, hundred thousand dollars worth of operating cost and they received $250,000 from the Small Business Administration under their PPP program, you would subtract that out for the maximum. So the maximum total loan that a person could get would be $950,000. I've had a lot of questions while I'm just here, just to make it a little easier. How do you come up with that operating cost? Well, if you had a certain operating cost before the pandemic, where it was and then an operating cost during the pandemic, the difference would be what you would do to multiply by 12 to get you through where you were. Uh, next slide, please. This loan is not gonna be dispersed in one disbursement to uh, the borrower, it will be closed escrow and then upon invoices and needed funds, it will be dispersed through the lender. Like I said, there's a 10 year maximum year, one year worth of principal and interest and extended principal deferrals. Next slide, please, Mark. Loans must be adequately secured. The collateral discounting by the lender is not required what that means is in a regular program, we discount real estate by 20%, equipment by 30%, and everything else by 40% to make sure that you have a one-to-one -one debt service coverage ratio. In this program, we do not have to do any discounting. And as long as it's one-to-one, -one, you're eligible for the funds. 
the value of the collateral fair market value must be equal to or greater than the amount of the loan. Next slide, please. Appraisals of real estate and chattel collateral required when the amount of the loan exceeds a million dollars unless the chattel is newly acquired and is supported by a bill of sale. We can use appraisals up to two years old. And during the pandemic, we are not requiring that a actual site inspection of the collateral is not required under certain circumstances as long as they can determine a fair market value. Next slide, please. The, the borrower has to show a 10% equity in the business. In other words, in our regular program, we require tangible balance sheet equity, but in, on the CARES Act program, we're just requiring equity. So your assets minus your liabilities divided by your assets have to come up to 10% to qualify for the cost. If they don't, the borrower can inject money into the business to meet that 10%. Next slide, please. And this is just basically saying, uh, this slide here is just basically how to calculate that percent equity with uh, your assets minus your uh, non-current assets and then dividing it back by your assets. Next slide, please, Mark. And we just covered, it's the same thing. Next slide, please, Mark. Next slide, please. Okay, application information. Next slide, please. Loans for working capital classified as category exclusions for purposes of the agency's environmental requirements. The agency has to do a NEPA environmental review on all of their programs and funds, and there's different levels of review, and this is the, the uh, shortest and most minor level of review that we'll do. And since it's for working capital, um, it, it's a quick review. A draft loan agreement is not required for this application. A business plan or feasibility study is not required either. And lenders may rely <coughs> on the borrower's tax returns when financial statements prepared in accordance with GAAP are not available for the borrower. Agricultural producers financial records must meet the industry standard accounting practices. And for anybody who's going to uh, request under $600,000, we ask them to use the simplified application. Next slide, please, Mark. Applications are received in our state office and funds will be remain. Uh, maintained on a national office reserve account, the agency will consider applications in the order that are received. Towards the end of the funding period, the agency will assign priority points for the limited remaining funds. And that's gonna be based on area, um, unemployment rates, things of that nature. But right now we have plenty of money in this program. So uh, the score is uh, sort of irrelevant. Next slide, please, Mark. And roughly uh, the BNI uh, CARES Act provided roughly about 50% of these funds are earmarked just for ag production and roughly about $475,500,000. Next slide, please. And also a lender or borrower may combine applications for the CARES Act loan working capital with an application in a regular program for b and funds if they were going to expand or needed new equipment or things of that nature. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, which is resource links. And these are regulations that you can look up funds availability, and of course, our website. Next slide, please, Mark. 
and state office contacts and state office, uh, the national office contacts for this program is Aaron Morris, our program processing division, and David Chestnut. Next slide, please, Mark. And this is my uh, email address and phone number. If anybody would like to take that down, I'll be glad to talk to them. If you want to send me an email or would like a copy of this slideshow, I can send it to you. Uh, and just thank you for having me and uh, we'll answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. I think the next person up is uh, Miss Jeanette Smith. Is this correct, Miss Smith? Jeanette, are you on? I'm not on. Well, hi. There you go. <laughs> I was talking to myself. Here we go. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, this is my first Zoom meeting, so um, welcome to the Farm Service Agency part of the program today. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, Farm Service Agency is a part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture that administers programs that provide a safety net for farmers and ranchers. Um, just so you know, the counties that I cover are Frederick, Clark, Warren, and Shenandoah. Go to the next slide. Um, if you're new to Farm Service Agency, we have some things that we will need to get from you. When you come in, we will try to make an appointment to set up um, your farm and your information by getting your name, address, phone number, email, social security, TIN number, and any other like entity documents, surveys or deeds to your land, leases and other information that if you might have your land leased or other affiliates. And just be ready to discuss some of your op farm operation and program goals. Next slide. And some of our programs that we have available are ARC PLC, um, FSFL, ELAP, MAL, LDP, WIP, LIP, TAP, DMC, NAP, Disaster, and LFP. And let's just go over a couple of them. FSFLs are for farm storage facility loans, um, which I have quite a few of those in my county. It could be grain bins, cold storage, hay storage, um, marketing assistant loans are commodity loans on your corn, wheat, barley, soybeans. Um, WIP is a disaster program that's going on right now with 2018 and 19 disaster conditions. LIP is a livestock incentive program where if you have some livestock that gets um, killed by or you know have a deceased by a natural weather um, condition, then you may be able to be eligible for some payments on your livestock. Then we have the tree assistance program, which is dealing with vines and trees, tree losses due to natural disasters. The DMC is the milk program. And then the NAP is for non-insured crops that crop insurance does not cover. And in my area, we have a lot of um, hay and pasture coverage. And that'll right now, that'll be all. So go to the next slide. And then one of our other big programs is our conservation program. Um, <clears throat> in my county, it's mainly CREP. <clears throat> in all four of my counties, excuse me. Um, CREP is a 
which you would put away into a riparian area, plant trees and get a payment on it for 10 to 15 years and also provide some cost share to put up some fencing, water and trough systems and planting the trees. Um, we also have the grasslands program. We also have the general CRP and then we, which is taking land out of production, but that one doesn't come through every year. They have special announcements for that program. We have the SAFE program, we have emergency forest restoration, and then we have the emergency conservation program, which in our area has came into effect when we had floods and things and tornadoes and things like that. Next slide. Right now, tomorrow is our deadline, September 11th, for the Coronavirus Assistance Program. Um, it was, of course, began in May 26, and it was for producers that were affected by the coronavirus. It, it has provided up to 16 billion in direct payments to provide relief to those that were impacted by the corona pandemic, and it provides assistance to producers and agriculture commodities that suffered a 5% or greater price decline and had losses due to market supply chain disruptions due to COVID, and who have faced additional significant marketing cost as a result of this lower demand and surplus production and just disruptions in the in patterns. And again, I say tomorrow, <clears throat> this slide says the 28th, but tomorrow is September 11th, and it is the deadline because they extended it from the 28th. So you can go to the online tool if you're interested. And like I said, we're cutting it close. Uh, www.farmers.gov CFAP. Next slide. And a few things we do, we do Gov delivery, which um, we use your email. So a lot of my farmers have signed up with emails and text messages. Um, don't have as many text messages as I do emails, but we're working on increasing that every, every week. So if, you, if you're in my area, you would text it to BA Shenandoah at 372-6669, sorry. And if you're in some other area, if you look at the bottom of the slide, it'll give you, like if you're in Amelia or Southampton or Rockingham, you can do the same thing and text it to them. Next slide. And again, I'm Jeanette Smith. I'm the County Executive Director here in Strasburg, Virginia. And if you need me, my phone number is there. And if you absolutely want to email me, it's my name, Jeanette.Smith at number two, sorry, Jeanette.Smith number two at USDA.gov. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeanette. We have USDA Natural Resource Conservation Services. Brent Veritao. Uh, Michael, why do you skip one? It should be Zachary. Zachary. Walter. Okay. Isaiah Morris, uh, farm owner officer at Augusta County, FSA. Uh, hang on, I'm, I'm looking for the other one. I think it's. Do, 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 do. One moment. Uh, was it the. It's not. No, not NRCS, right? The second F. Oh, I got it. I got it. If you didn't find it, I can send it to you again. Is this it? Yes, sir. That's it. Okay, here we go. Give me one second. Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Zachary Waldron, and I'm a farm loan officer for the Farm Service Agency. So we work basically as a sister agency with Jeanette in the farm uh, surgeons in the farm program side, uh, and I work in the loan side, uh, dealing with direct loans and loans. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So basically, like Jeanette said, we're under an uh, uh, agency under the United States Department of Agriculture. 
and like I said, I work under the farm loan program side. So we deal with credit for all agriculture producers that are in production agriculture that are unable to obtain credit from a commercial or private lender. Uh, and then we have a lot of programs that are designed uh, for beginning farmers, for young people getting started, and those uh, historically underserved uh, programs, which meet some of those minorities and uh, women and minorities and those kind of things. Next, please. So basically a little introduction about our credit is that once again, if you're unable to obtain credit from a commercial ag lender to start, purchase, sustain, extend your farm, then you can look into some of the uh, FSA farm loan programs. Right now with the way the markets are, we're seeing a large in influx in our programs just because of uh, you know, kind of the instability in the market due to COVID and, and some of these markets, whether you're doing direct sales or whatnot. So we're seeing a large influx in request in our loan programs. Uh, and then it kind of, like I say, the loans are based upon what you'll, what you'll need and what you're looking at. So I'll go over a little bit about each of the different loan programs that we have available for you. Uh, next. So basically, under farm loan programs, we have direct loans, which is where we service and maintain the loans in our office. Uh, right now in our office, and I'm in Verona, which covers basically the 81 corridor. Uh, we maintain about 400 uh, loan applicants in our office. Uh, and basically the funds are come from the US Treasury. And then we also have what they call guaranteed loans. And those are where another commercial lender makes a loan and services a loan. And then they're able to get uh, an FSA guarantee or backing on the loan for up to 95% of any of the losses that they have uh, given if they follow the, the program requirements uh, that we have set forth. Next. So basically the types of loans that we have are operating loans, which these can be used for just what's listed here, livestock uh, purchases, machinery and equipment, uh, vegetable crop inputs or inputs for seeds, plants, fertilizer, or other operating expenses. Uh, we do have options to do look at refinancing some debts, uh, operating debts to kind of help maybe improve your situation and get you over that hurdle if, if you're facing some challenges maybe from that, or also reorganize a farm or do some minor improvements, uh, such as if you want to install maybe a cooler into an existing building to allow you to do some value added and uh, some other programs out there that are the niche markets and whatnot that are available. So next. With the FSA operating loans, basically we have a maximum uh, statutory regulation of 400,000 that we can loan. Uh, so that's where we're capped out at as far as the amount of loans we can do on the operating side. Uh, and the rates are basically set on a monthly basis and they're fixed after they're approved. The rate right now is running about 1.25 fixed. Uh, so that's a very good rate given this times to kind of get, get young people or, or beginning farmers or minorities started. Uh, and then the term on these loans varies based on the type of loan, but it's generally from one to seven years. Next. And here's a little bit about the eligibility requirements uh, for our loan programs, for the operating loan. Basically, we're out there to finance family sized farms. Uh, so we don't deal with, you know, a lot of the larger commercial sized farms. We're there to help the, the family sized farms. And if you're unable to get credit from a, another lender, uh, and there's lots of lenders in our area that we work with uh, that know our programs and know what it takes. Uh, so they a lot of times will refer people to us and uh, at least we got to one of the things with our programs is we got to possess at least one year of some type of farm training or experience within the last five. Uh, a beginning farmer, so it works well for a lot of the commercial banks, like I say, if you go over that 600,000 or uh, if they're just needed out there or they want to maybe partner with and do 50-50 with us. Uh, and then FSA once again, requires that 100% of security on our portion. So we take into account what's out there in front of us. 
uh, and then what our loan is, and we can't go over that 100%. Next. Next. And then one more type of loan owned to this farm ownership loan is what they call a beginning farmer down payment loan. And this program basically requires a 5% purchase price down. 5% of the purchase price is a cash payment. And then FSA does 45%, not to exceed $300,150. And another lender, which can be a private owner financing or can also be a lender, commercial lender, must provide the other 50%. And it has the same requirements as a uh, farm ownership loans, except for you have to be in that socially disadvantaged or beginning farmer definition to participate. And the commercial lender can once again get a 95% guarantee on the loan. And the holdback on this loan in some regards that we've seen is basically that our loan, the FSA loan, has to be, or excuse me, the commercial bank loan has to be amortized out 30 years without a balloon payment before 20, and the FSA loan has to be amortized out 20 years. So the FSA loan actually has a shorter term than the commercial loan. So sometimes that causes a lot of banks don't like to go out much more than 20. So sometimes there's that program doesn't work well. And then if you're using this to finance, it's supposed to be used to finance the real estate. So it doesn't work well a lot of times uh, if you need to do a shorter term on your loan because that's what it can be set up if you're if you're a sole member entity or two person uh, LLC maybe that has um, some such that meets that criteria. Next. And then a beginning farmer. Uh, you could you could be an SDA and a beginning farmer. Uh, in our in our classifications, but a beginning farmer is an in, individual or entity who is operated for less than ten years, which applies to all entity members. So it doesn't work for like a mom, mom and a dad maybe that have been in farming for forty years and now the son wants to join. They want to set up an LLC. That wouldn't be classified as a beginning farmer. But uh, what we work with a lot, and I see a lot over here where I'm at in the valley, is a lot of you know, young people wanting to get in and mom and dad are maybe willing to pledge the land to put the poultry house on, for example, but uh, and lease it to them on a long-term lease, but maybe not ready to, you know, they don't, they, so then they can utilize our programs and still be a beginning farmer. Uh, and substantially, you got to substantially participate in the operation. And once again, the FO, the farmer that's applying for the beginning farmer can't own more than that 30% of the average farm. So we're not, not set up to finance the large commercial farm for help there to help you get started and the young people get started that don't already have a large land base. Uh, and available resources are not sufficient to enable them to enter or continue on a viable scale. And all entity members are related by blood or marriage and must be beginning farmers. And then like I say, you gotta meet the requirements for the type of one. Next. So a spinoff that they've recently added with us over the last five years or so is what they call a microloan program. Uh, Congress has felt the need to finance some of these smaller loans maybe uh, for people that are started and getting out. And, and I found that these work good for like vegetables and, and those type of operations that don't need a lot of credit, but just need a little bit to get them started. Uh, this is for, once again, providing assistance for smaller and beginning farmers. It's a simplified application process. Uh, I always try to work though to still build a good sound plan with my applicants uh, because I always tell them, you know, I can, I can loan you a small amount of money or a lot amount of money and still get you into, into a tight situation where it doesn't work. So if I do my own work up front uh, and take my time, then I can help you build a successful viable business uh, and get you going. Uh, and then it assists with somebody that has limited experience uh, this program, you know, there, it's a little bit softer on the eligibility experience. And, it, and it's a way to kind of eliminate high costs for personal loans and credit cards that have high interest rates, maybe that typically people turn to because they're easy types of credit when they want to get started into a small scale niche type operation. And also provides a bridge for our youth loans. 
to transition to a little small to a larger operation. Next. So under that microloan program, we have what they call direct farm operating loans, which is very similar to um, our operating loan program, except for it's capped out at 50,000. The same with the direct farm ownership loans, we have a, a cap of 50,000 uh, on that program as well. So just depending on what it's gonna be used for is kind of how uh, we, would, we would assess it for what it is, whether it's a micro operating loan or a micro farm ownership loan. Uh, and, and the requirements and the uses are similar to what we discussed earlier. And once again, it's just a simplified application process and uh, a little bit more, less verification, you know, paperwork. Next. So to be eligible for a micro loan, you basically have to have the same criteria and eligibility as any other direct loan. Uh, like I say, with that, with that exception to that managerial ability, it's just a little bit uh, not quite as um, strict maybe on what it needs to be. If you've got some type of small business experience or business experience, we may be able to uh, substitute that for at least one year to get you into the operating loan side. Next. And this just explains the uh, microloan uh, operating loan managerial requirement. Basically, like I just mentioned, uh, past participation in agriculture, like a 4-H program or FFA, or one of the beginning farmer and rancher development programs that, that are out there offered through a lot of extension in the schools, or SBA or agriculture internships. And then also, if you would have had a FSA uh, youth loan with us, uh, which I didn't mention about much today, but that's just a small loan for less than 5,000 for somebody with a 4-H project between the ages of 10 to 21. Next. And then for a micro loan farm ownership loan, uh, it also, it has the same requirements of the three years of farm management experience but there's a little bit of a, uh, a room to substitute for like a mentorship or farm experience gain uh, to the SCORE program or uh, one of the other programs that are out there. Next. So the direct OL micro loans, we have what you could do an annual operating loan, which generally is secured 100% on a crop or though the inputs into a crop and then is repaid in one year. Uh, and generally, if you can get additional security up to 150% or required to do that. And then a term operating loan, such as for cattle equipment uh, and that such, is, is once again uh, secured by that object that you're buying or, or piece of property. And a direct uh, farm ownership micro loan. Uh, this program works well, like I say, for since it's limited at 50,000 for someone that wants to maybe purchase a small piece of real estate and get started uh, with a crop operation, maybe on a couple acres or something. Or also, if you are looking at maybe a larger piece and don't have the down payment that's necessary for the bank, but you're a good candidate for them, you may look to use this micro loan farm ownership program to provide you the uh, the 20% down on a piece of purchase of a property that you're looking at to get you started. Next. So just a few application tips. Our applications are available online or at the local FSA offices. So if you visit uh, farmers.gov or uh, just type in FSA farm loan programs into a Google search, it'll pull up the USDA farm farm loans and it gives a lot, a lot about our programs and the eligibility requirements and some of that information. As well as uh, work to build yourself a business plan. That's, that's critical uh, to me because that kind of helps me along with your goals, you know, provide you with assistance for what you want and to get you where you want to go. So it kind of gives me a good sound plan as a loan officer looking at it on what you want to do and, and, and how you want to do it and what your goals are so I can help you meet those goals. And then plan conservatively. So like I say, utilize maybe some of those uh, resources or websites that are out there with extension or if there's an existing market maybe that sells wholesale, not retail or something. Look at some of those options to see how you can uh, build a sound plan. Uh, 
and then just like I said, get those supporting documents or that historical from someone, maybe the neighboring farmer or something that can maybe would provide you a little assistance and have good financial records and then um, just get help from the experts. So with Virginia uh, Extension and some of those programs. Next. So in summary, basically FSA offers direct loans, which include operating and farm ownership loans. And a lot of our funds are targeted towards beginning farmers and historically underserved for both operating and farm ownership. And we do a lot of partnerships uh, with a lot of commercial lenders out there that work in the market. And uh, we have direct operating and farm ownership microloans for 50,000 or less uh, that can sometimes be utilized where needed and allow just a little bit less experience and a little less uh, paperwork and then basically fulfill the needs of some of those smaller beginning farmer and niche markets. Next. And then this is just, uh, there's seven offices in Virginia. So here's just a quick chart of where our offices are at. So the main yellow uh, bullets are where our main farm loan offices are located at in the state of Virginia to assist you where needed. Uh, so you would just refer to your office if you're in that colored area there. Next. And also you can look at the farm loan discovery tool, which is a new thing that they put up, which can kind of offer you a few short questions to learn about what you want to do to point you in the right direction. Uh, so that's something that we have available at farmers.gov at that website to help you all kind of look through and, and discover some of our programs and our farm loan programs and, and make it easier and more user friendly to figure out and get you to the right spot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zach, for that wonderful presentation. And up next will be NRCS. Uh, Brent, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Ready for it, Mark. Thank you. Well, thanks, Diane. Um, if, if anyone has a hard time hearing me, just let me know. I have this new laptop and the Mac and the microphone is not the best, I guess. I've been told it's hard to hear me sometimes. But uh, yes, thanks. Thanks uh, for all the participants. Come listen to this presentation. Uh, I am Brent Barito. I'm the district conservationist at the Strasburg Field Office, which is also where Jeanette Smith, who spoke earlier, uh, is is also at the same office on Queen Street in uh, Strasburg in northern Shenandoah County. And of course, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, is an agency within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, I've been I've been at this office for 11 years and the district conservationist for almost four. Next slide, please. So at NRCS, we, prov we offer both technical and financial assistance programs to landowners and agricultural producers. The agency was originally founded due to excessive soil erosion across the entire United States. Many people point at the Dust Bowl as a, as a really high soil loss event in the 30s, but honestly, there was a tremendous amount of soil erosion um, all through the US and really um, Virginia was no different. Um, so that's how the agency was originally founded. And then in the mid to late 90s, NRCS began offering the financial assistance programs. So next slide, please. So really with anything we do, we have to be really, I have to be a very good listener and all, all the Natural Resources Conservation Service employees have to be a real attentive listener because what we try to do is understand your vision 
and your, your long and short-term objectives with your farm operation or, or just any land management you would like to do on your farm and try to put that on paper for you. You know, put down a plan that will achieve your vision. And we, of course, being a government agency, have to categorize everything. We call it the nine steps of conservation planning. Um, and, but, you know, in, in other jobs I've had, I did the exact same work. We just didn't call it the nine steps. But it's basically understanding your vision, being able to put that down on paper for you, uh, review it with you, make any changes that, that would um, benefit the plan, um, but really it's, it's your plan and we just really work with you. So next slide, please. And of course, uh, what, what we, the main, our main objectives, well, we have two main objectives when we're listening to you, trying to understand your vision and giving you feedback. And the feedback should hopefully achieve two goals. One would be improving the natural resources on your property, whether it be the soil, the plants, whether it be cash crops or pasture or native plants for wildlife habitat the water quality, uh, air quality. Um, these are all resource, what we call uh, natural resources. And if the, the farm operation uh, is either negatively impacting it or you just want to improve any of these natural resources, uh, we can try to achieve, help you achieve those goals. Um, but uh, well, that's it. Next slide, please. So really that, that first step, that technical assistance, we go, we do, we, that's really the first step for all, all the landowners and agricultural producers that call me and invite me out to their land to have a conversation is really that technical assistance is really the first, first step. And if I'm able to put a plan together that achieves your vision, you, you're, you're able to apply for financial assistance to help offset the cost of implementing that plan. And of course, being for, you know, working for USDA, there are a few eligibility requirements. Um, one is, we have, you have to be in compliance with our highly erodible land and wetland conservation. The wetland one's fairly straightforward, where if there's a wetland on your property, to be eligible for our programs, you, you cannot drain it and grow crops on it or dredge it or fill it. Basically, if you have a wetland on your property, it has to stay a, a full, you know, fully functioning wetland. In addition to that, though, if, if the wetland had been impacted in the past, maybe by previous ownership or, you know, maybe by previous family members even, we do have programs to restore wetlands. The highly erodible land, that's a little more, a little vague probably for people, but basically what it is, is um, it has nothing to do with your farm operation. The parameters are the soil types you have, the steepness of the slope, and your local precipitation. And with those three factors, we determine whether or not a particular piece of land is highly erodible or non-highly erodible. And if it is highly erodible, then we just have to put a plan together in order to conserve the soil on those acres so that the soil is not eroding at such a level that it would decrease your productivity. Another eligibility requirement is adjusted gross income. And very rarely do I, do I work with someone that doesn't meet the AGI requirement because 
uh, your adjusted gross income average over three years would have to be more than nine hundred thousand dollars, and that's nine hundred thousand dollars per three per year, basically. So um, most folks who call the office do not have adjusted gross income more than nine hundred thousand dollars. So next slide, please. So some of the, the different kinds of land and uh, farm operations we work with, of course, is cropland, uh, grazing, livestock grazing operations, forest land, uh, non-industrial private forest land. So we wouldn't be working with like Mead West Baco or any of the other big timber companies. But of course, if you sell your log, you're a private timber land owner and you sell your logs to a large industrial uh, forest operation, you know, we can still work with you. Um, livestock operations, I believe what that means is more of uh, like feeding operations and then of course organic farms. Next slide please. We also have some uh, wildlife programs um, and so this would be landowners who are interested uh, in improving the wildlife habitat on their property. It could be for specific uh, wildlife like the bobwhite quail, but honestly all the, all the projects we do where we're improving the native plant communities, uh, the plant uh, diversity on farms, it will benefit many, many, many different kinds of wildlife. Um, and, and that's just, that's just how it is because the, the diverse habitat will attract, you'll be surprised by just changing some of the plant composition on your landscape, how many different wild, uh, wildlife species will end up visiting the, the property. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, both Jeanette and, um, I'm sorry, Zach, uh, both spoke about um, historically underserved uh, populations. So the Natural Resources Conservation Service absolutely has those same historically underserved um, application types. The only difference between Farm Service Agency and NRCS is that women do not fall in to the un historically underserved category. So we do have the, the socially disadvantaged, the beginning farmer, and the limited resource farmer categories, and the veteran farmer. And if you qualify for one of these, uh, through one of these um, historically underserved groups, you get a, a, a slightly higher uh, reimbursement rate for, uh, for the financial assistance but also the, I think one of the larger advantages that not too many uh, folks take advantage of is uh, if you meet certain criteria, you can get a, an advance payment before you've actually completed anything to, you know, basically to buy materials or um, basically to get the project started. Um, but it, the criteria for it is pretty rigid. So I think, could be why not too many people take advantage of it. But you do, you do have that benefit offered to you as a historically underserved participant. Next slide, please. So, so, up, uh, so being located in the Shenandoah Valley, especially in the Northern part here, we, have, we do have quite a few different uh, different kind of livestock operations, many grazing operations. And um, usually the natural resources that the livestock impact would be water quality and, and soil erosion, uh, especially along uh, streams or springs where they're getting down into the, the, the stream or uh, even river and sometimes and just, you know, beating the banks up uh, and, and not letting the vegetation persist on the banks. 
to hold it there. So it does, believe it or not, does quite cause quite a, bot, quite a bit of uh, soil erosion. But also on the upland part of the landscape, uh, you know, we help if your vision is to be able to uh, manage grazing, there are the livestock programs would provide financial assistance for things like installing fence so you could control the animals and rotationally graze them. And also corresponding water troughs, automatic water troughs that would be fed by a well uh, with which the well, water well could also be part of the financial system. So uh, the, the livestock projects can be very involved, but you know, if you, the, the landowner or the farmer is really, you know, describing to me what their vision of, of their farm would be. And that's, that's what we um, put down on paper. And just like with any USDA program, it does not matter the size. Um, of course, with livestock, um, you would have to have, you know, at least some acres, but for like the vegetable production side, you know, work with people that might only have an acre in vegetable production, but they are completely eligible for the natural resource conservation assistance. Next slide, please. This is just one picture of what we would consider a resource concern. Uh, you have a denuded landscape with a small stream running through there. There's gonna be a lot of soil erosion. Obviously there's no forages for the livestock to uh, consume. So I, I would say this is a pretty bad situation that um, we would happily help you uh, address this. Next slide, please. Again, this was just, you know, this to me probably looks more like, a, could have been like a feedlot or something where they have a large, large number of livestock confined to a small area. Uh, it's winter time, um, vegetation's not growing, but, uh, you know, it's completely bare soil. And you can imagine what would happen if we had a rain, at least up here, we had a huge rainstorm last night and um, you get a couple inches of rain and a few hours on that, on that landscape and you would have quite a bit of soil erosion. So we can work, work with you. If this is something you wanna fix, this, we can work with you to help you fix this. Next slide, please. And this is just another example of uh, projects we would work with landowners and farmers. Um, in this particular case, you can see, sure, there's a stream in the foreground of the picture down at the bottom of the hill, but probably more concerning to this farmer is there's a, a pretty good gully running down the fence line. Um, so not only is this particular farm losing soil due to erosion, but they potentially could lose that fence that the, the goal is running down. And this is something that we could help, help resolve for you. So next slide, please. And this is just a picture of one of the automatic waters we would install. Um, so, so like I said, this, this provides many advantages to the farm operation and the livestock. Uh, we get them up out of the streams um, where they could be causing soil erosion and degrading water quality, but we get them up grazing up on the hillside, the water troughs away from the water. Um, and we would obviously listen to your input of where the water troughs would be placed to efficiently graze the property. So mo probably 95% of the water troughs that we install up here are tied to a newly drilled well. So the well water is going to be 
hopefully free of bacteria and much cleaner. So the livestock, a lot of times before the stream, uh, before the stream fencing is put up to exclude them from the riparian area in the stream, they'll begin, begin using these water troughs right away because they, I guess they just know the water's cleaner, um, but definitely free of bacteria. And at least up in this part of the state, nearly every stream is impaired and the impairments are usually excessive nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, but also bacteria. So by getting them out of the stream and providing this clean water source, hopefully you'll have quicker, more weight gain, quicker weight gain, and less, less issues where you might have to call the vet because of, of illness. Next slide, please. This is a good ex example of uh, a riparian forest buffer. So in the foreground, you can see there's a fence. You can see the fence post. It's hard to see the fence wire, um, but you can see the fence post in the foreground. And then uh, within it, all those tubes have a native hardwood tree in them. So whereas in the past, your internet connection is unstable. Can, I just got a message that said my internet connection is unstable. Everyone just still hear me? Diane? Yes, we, we can still hear you. Okay. I don't know what that warning was about. Sorry about that. Uh, um, so convert a, you know, previously a grazed area on the farm to eventually be filled with native hardwood trees and the hardwood trees would be selected on site conditions, the soil type, the aspect of the land. Um, and those are, those are the main things, but also they would be trees selected that would provide a wildlife be benefit, whether it be they produce a hard, hard or soft mass, like a nut or some kind of fruit uh, for the wildlife. And again, you, the landowner, producer, they, they could have input on the species selection. Uh, it does have to be pretty diverse, um, usually seven to nine species, but um, of different trees, but, and it could be shrubs. And if you wanted something that was, you know, flat, like a more of a flower, flowering dogwood or redbud mixed in there too, that would be perfect. Um, Brent, I can't hear you. Uh-oh. What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. <clears throat> yes. All right, Mark, can I, next slide, please? Oh, sure. So this just goes to uh, some examples of the reimbursements. So with the, with the financial assistance, you would have a contract with NRCS and we would give you all the recommendations and um, designs that you need to successfully install the practices to our specifications. And then you, you would do the work and we'd come out and measure it and inspect it. And then you would receive a reimbursement in the form of a direct deposit to your bank account that you set up at the beginning of the contract. So there, you know, for different fence types, we got $1.99 a foot for high tensile electric fence, a little bit, a few cents more for barbed wire and a little bit more for woven wire. The interior fencing has a, a lesser reimbursement rate and that's because we are, our standards require a lesser fence for the interior fence. It doesn't have to be um, for existence for, you know, just for the high tensile electric, it just has to have less wires. So um, it just, it's a lesser fence, doesn't have to be built uh, quite as sturdy, not sturdy, that's not the right word, but anyways. 
Um, and also, if you wanted to implement a prescribed grazing, you could get reimbursement for that, where you would you would install all the infrastructure, the fence, the water system, if there's any a stream crossing needed. And once you get all the infrastructure in, you begin rotational grazing the, fence, the livestock based on a plan that we would develop with your input. And you can receive a, an incentive payment to do that. Um, the well, the pipeline, the trough, there's um, some reimbursements there. The well reimbursement, $24 a foot, that, that's a very good reimbursement um, in the pipeline and trough. And like I said, notes on the bottom, these reimbursements do not reflect the historically underserved customers. So these rates would be s slightly higher. Um, if you qualify as historically underserved. Next slide, please. Uh, high tunnels. So yes, high, we receive many, many applications for high tunnels every year. Uh, everyone that's ever installed a high tunnel has just expressed uh, how much it has helped with their Usually it's vegetable production, but not always, could be uh, fruit production. But it, it's definitely um, focused on people that want to grow fruits and vegetables in the natural soil profile. Um, it's, it is not meant for livestock at all, and it's not meant for potted plants or, you know, where you would grow Nurse, uh, like nursery stock in pots, it, it's not meant for that. It really is meant for growing vegetable, fruits and vegetables for production in the natural soil. Next slide, please, Mark. So the, the eligibility, um, for the high tunnel is similar as all the programs, but it really, you really do need to be growing a fruit or vegetable or, or herb that um, would benefit from growing in the high tunnel. So as long, as long as when you call me up and you invite me out to the farm, even if it's, um, you know, just a couple hundred square feet garden or something, it, you have to have something growing out there uh, to be eligible for, for the high tunnel. Um, so this one note on the slide though, at the bottom it says, if FSA determines that the agricultural land is not producing or does not produce agricultural crops, uh, FSA would not do that. It would actually be an, an NRCS employee. You know, we would be the ones coming out to meet you on the farm and, re and really just visually <laughs> Being that you're growing fruits and vegetables, um, that 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 we would make that determination. Next slide, please. So uh, a little bit more about the high tunnel. Um, it does have to be a manufacturer's kit that's brand new. So you would you would apply for the financial assistance. And if you got a contract with us, you would have to purchase a new kit. And there is a few uh, specifications. For instance, the plastic, the plastic has to be at least four mil. Uh, and the mils is a measurement, not millimeters, just four mil uh, plastic. And there's a few other um, specifications that the, the, the kit would have to, uh, come with and then you you construct it and then we come out and reimburse you by the square foot of high tunnel constructed and then you know to benefit yourself but also to help me out uh, we ask that you just keep some some brief records on, on the crops that you grow in there and any uh, soil amendments or anything you need that uh, you use and it's really just uh, to build knowledge base and also to try to get landowners and farmers in, in just in the mode of kind of writing down uh, the different activities 
that they do on the farm. Uh, next slide, please. And the, these are just some, um, the reimbursements, $2.64 a square foot and $3.12 a square foot, depending on whether or not it's the rounded or the, the Gothic, the peak style uh, high tunnel. Most people construct the Gothic, the peaked roof. Um, I believe it can take a higher snow load, which obviously is not uh, needed in all parts of Virginia, but up, up here, um, there are times we get pretty, pretty good snow and it's usually heavy. It's, you know, it's that heavy snow. We don't really get that light fluffy snow anymore. Um, and again, the beginning farmer, socially disadvantaged limited resource farmer would receive a higher reimbursement rate for the high tunnel. So next slide, please. Um, so this is just a real, real brief rundown of the application process. Um, it's a four page, four page application. It's real easy to fill out. Um, if you need help, obviously I would help you or another NRCS employee would help you fill it out. Um, but really but the idea is you would be able to complete it on your own. And I think most, most folks can. Um, there's a, a contract appendix that comes with it. It's, uh, it's about nine pages long and you just read through that and, and ask any questions. And really what it is, it's, it's the contract. We just give it to you up front with the application. So you have plenty of time to read it and be able to ask questions. Um, like I said earlier, we, we do all our reimbursements through direct deposit. And um, we, of course, we have a direct deposit form and you know, it'd be a bank account that you choose. It just uh, would have to be associated with either, if you're applying as an individual, it would be associated with your social security number. Or if you're applying as an entity, it would be uh, associated with that entity's tax ID number. Um, so that's, that would be that. And then if you do apply for an entity, as an entity, there would be a few more uh, paperwork, a little bit more paperwork to fill out than if you were just applying as an individual. And then it would be helpful to FSA if you if you had a map of the property. Uh, luckily, the the four counties that uh, Jeanette and I work in, they have all their parcel records online, so that is helpful. But um, obviously, if you if you have a map printed out or your parcel records printed out, that is always helpful for us as well. So next slide, please. So the next steps. Um, kind of been going through that the whole time. And really, call me up and we go out there. We put a plan together. You apply for financial assistance to uh, implement the plan. It's a competitive process. We receive many more applications than we can fund. When I say we have Virginia, Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia as a state, uh, we always receive many more applications than we can fund each year. So the way we, um, the way we do that, we run your application through an assessment. We assess it based on the resource concerns that were have been identified and the resource concerns that will be addressed through the financial assistance contract. And your the assessment gets a ranking score and whoever has the highest ranking score, they get funded first and we just go down the line until the money's spent. Um, so that's, that's kind of the process in a real, real nutshell. So next slide, please. And this again is just a brief timeline. So um, it does not include the part, the most important part, which is meeting you on the farm and discussing your vision and understanding it. But we do have sign up program, sign up deadlines. And just yesterday, 
I was told that potentially we may have our first application deadline in November. So, so the Natural Resources Conservation Service may have a first sign up deadline in November. Um, I have not seen anything official on that yet, but typically our first application deadline would usually be in December. So, you know, our fiscal year starts on October 1st and then um, have application deadline. And then <clears throat> if, if I don't have a solid plan put together yet, I would, I would finish that plan and, you know, prior to you applying, if I didn't have something on paper, I put it on paper for you, review it with you, make sure it's the, the project you would like to submit for financial assistance. And then I would go through that assessment process, the assessment and ranking. And then in Richmond at the state office, they select the applications based on that ranking score for funding. You would receive a letter from me, but also a phone call or email letting you know that your application has been pre-approved for funding. And then we would uh, discuss the project further, make sure it's exactly how you like it. And then I would develop a contract which you would sign. Once the contract is signed and obligated, I would provide you with all the necessary designs and, pract and uh, conservation practice specifications so you could install the project to our, to our standards to make sure you get that reimbursement. You install the practices, we come out and inspect them, and then I would, I would email or mail you a payment application, which you would sign, return to me, and then the money, the reimbursement would be directly deposited in your bank account. Next slide. And any questions? Um, I will say I did, I did not have my contact information on this PowerPoint, but it's, uh, the address and the phone number is same as from Jeanette's slide. It's the, the office number is 540-465-2424 and my extension is 114. And if you're not in Frederick, Shenandoah, Clark or Warren counties, you could, you could still give me a call and I could, I could email you the information of of the district conservationists for the county that you that you live in. So, but thank you for your time listening to this. I appreciate appreciate it. Thank you, Brett, for that wonderful presentation. Up next is Herman Ellis with NAS. Thank you, Diane. Can you hear me okay? Yes, great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Herman Ellison. I am the state statistician for the Virginia Field Office of USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service. I know on the agenda it says NAS, but NAS stands for National Agricultural Statistics Service. Today I will be talking to you about NAS and you. Next slide, Mark. One may ask, who is NAS? As the statistical agency for USDA, NAS mm -hmm. provides useful agricultural data to help you. Next, please. First, I want to give you a little history about our agency. The first agricultural statistician was George Washington. He did a eight survey questionnaire in five states. And that survey focused on land values, prices, and yields. The birth of USDA was on the Abe Lincoln in 1862. The intention was for this agency to, to gather information. The first crop report was July 1863. Next. Here's some history about NAS. Um, as I stated, we, we was established in 1863. Our agency was named Division of Statistics at that time, and the first report was on crop conditions. 
NAS today, we have more than 900 personnel. We serve in 50 states in Puerto Rico. We have 12 regional offices across the United States that service USDA and in, 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 uh, in the ag communities. And we also have a centralized data collection center in St. Louis, Missouri. Next. Our mission is to provide timely, accurate, and useful statistics in the service of U.S. agriculture. Next. You may ask, what do we do? We collect data, we assimilate data, we process it, and we um, stimulate it for USDA agricultural. We conduct hundreds national, regional, state, and local surveys. We conduct detailed agricultural census every five years. The last census was conducted in 2017. We are preparing for 2022 as we speak. We publish hundreds of national reports annually. We partner with the State Department of Ag, universities, and others we also conduct research to advance statistical science. Next, please. We do not set policies. We don't regulate activities. We don't permit influence. We don't disclose individual reports. We know we ask you for a lot of your information from your operation, from livestock inventory, uh, how the crops are progressing, you know, forecasting crops and, and those type of things. Uh, most of our data is voluntary. Your data is voluntary. You don't have to fill out the report. But um, it's very important that your data is provided to us to, you know, to tell your story. Um, we don't favor any groups above others. Next. Who do we serve? We, we serve our farm and ranchers. Next. Also, we serve our data users. Next slide, please. Working smarter means you are able to use reliable facts and figures to make well-informed decisions that eliminate guesswork, reduce risk, and improve profitability. Next, please. You can rely on the NAS data to determine the productivity and the yields in your area. You can look at the, you can track the trends, you can set prices, you can improve operational efficiencies, reduce risk, you can negotiate cash rents, you can identify trends, best practices, patterns, and analyze consumer demand. Next, please. Also, the manufacturers can use the data to work smarter. For example, they can identify the market opportunities, predict demand, determine the supply needs and inventories, develop new equipment tools, improve existing products and services, mm -hmm. develop software apps to advance farm, farm, farming, improve their availability to serve you better. Next, please. Also, we have USDA agencies that use the data. And here's just some examples. RMA, the Risk Management Agency uses the data to provide services such as crop insurance, farm service agencies, FSA use the data to make market assessments, and they also validate economic opportunities. Next, please. You may ask, how can you be counted? We have a farm definition that we go by, and the farm definition is a farm in any place which $1,000 of ag products are produced and sold and normally would have been sold during a census year. Normally would have been sold is a very 
a very important piece to note in this particular definition. Um, the reason I say normally, for example, if we have a drought or a person get flooded out during the year and they're not able to make a thousand dollars, but they have a potential to make a thousand dollars, but that that person or that operation is still considered a farm. And also, I just want to say that we also include government payments as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Now I want to talk about your participation. It is really important, as I stated before. Um, NAS data helps you to identify the health and well-being of your community. It helps you to, to tell your story about your operation and also to tell a story about millions who have come before you. Next slide. Hmm. Without your participation, uh, Government leaders cannot access the local data. Businesses cannot determine the right product mix. USDA, USDA cannot prepare or respond to crises. And for example, you heard me say a few minutes ago about the drought or any uh, areas that flooded out. This data is used to, uh, to help for those programs, help through those programs. Um, research cannot advance studies or solve Real world problems, real world problems. Next, please. Working smarter begins by participating, participating in our surveys, using the products and service that rely on our data, making well-informed decisions to eliminate guesswork, reduce risk, and improve profitability. Next, please. We are, in, we are committed in what we're doing, uh, what we do, and um, the agricultural data to help you. Here's my contact information and my email address if you need any assistance with data or have any questions about any of our surveys, uh, just a phone call away. Thank you. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Herma, for the excellent presentation. Uh, please make sure you have your phones on mute, please. Check it and make sure your phones are on mute. Uh, next person up is Lord Fairfax Soil and Water, Dana, ready for you. Hello there, and thank you for including me in, um, in this presentation. So I work for Lord Fairfax Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, next slide, please. So soil and water conservation districts, there are 47 of us across the state. We cover the vast majority of the state. And, um, you know, we're primarily geared toward promoting water quality, um, preventing soil erosion, helping with those things. We also provide technical assistance, um, financial assistance through the Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program. Um, VAX, that's our big thing, and, um, and, and just education programs. We do a lot of education in schools, also education to adult groups as well, and um, just working with farmers and landowners to promote conservation and help them maintain um, productive farm landscapes. Next slide, please. So um, our district covers Shenandoah, Frederick, Clark, and Warren counties and the city of Winchester. And um, like I said, we're one of 47 districts. We overlap and cooperate a lot with Farm Service Agency and Natural Resources Conservation Service. And in fact, our district offices are co-located in Strasburg with Brent and Jeanette. Um, that's not the case for all districts. Some of them are separate from NRCS, but, um, but there's still a lot of cooperation between the agencies. A lot of the conservation practices that we promote, that we cost share on, that we provide technical assistance for are very similar to um, practices that the other agencies work on as well. Next slide, please. So we are um, 
soil and water districts are what are considered a political subdivision of state government. That means that um, most of our funding, both for operations and for um, cost share to landowners, comes from Virginia state taxpayer dollars. Um, we also get a portion of our funding from the localities that we serve. And, and the percentage of that differs um, across the state from one district to another. But because we are um, partially funded by our localities and because we're kind of based in what the needs of those localities are, we are governed by an elected board of directors. So each, um, each county that a district encompasses gets two elected directors. Um, so some districts are single county districts. Then there's ones like ours that serve four counties. There are a couple that are larger than us, several that are somewhere in between. Um, so like, for example, our board is 12 members, two from each of the four counties in the city that we serve. And then we have two appointed directors. One of, is an extension um, agent and another is an, just an appointed director. Um, so they sort of oversee the work of the district, oversee the staff, and um, sort of help focus the state's priorities because um, at the state level the Department of Conservation and Recreation sets goals and priorities for soil and water and the work that we do and then the localities sort of help focus those priorities to the specific needs of their area. Um, so they, they sort of manage the way that we use the resources that the state provides us and the resources that our localities give us and um, serve as kind of a go-between for um, our organization and like county boards of supervisors um, and just other local agencies and um, producers. Next slide, please. So technical assistance and cost share is, is kind of our, our bread and butter. Um, our district currently has four conservation specialists. Like I said, that varies across the state. It depends on the amount of area that a district covers, the amount of work that they have to do there. And very much like the role that Brent and his staff have, we're there to um, meet with people and help them sort of um, maximize the potential of their property while also conserving um, water quality, improving water quality, improving grazing management, things of those natures. Um, trying to look at my notes here. So basically, just like Brent, we come to your farm and um, you know, we'll talk with you about what you've got going on, what resource concerns you have on the property, um, what your goals are, and then what sort of programs we have or advice we can give to help you meet those goals. Because not only are we worried about improving water quality, decreasing erosion, things like that, we also want to make sure that we're focused on farm productivity. Because if we don't, um, you know, if, if we help you install a conservation practice that doesn't also, or at least doesn't impede your ability to maintain a productive farm, then we haven't accomplished anything. Um, kind of the big things regarding um, technical and, and financial assistance. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So these are some of the most common cost share practices, particularly in our area of the state. Um, we administer a cost share program that encompasses a wide variety of um, options for landowners and, and things that we can work on, but these are kind of our, our big hallmark programs, stream exclusion, removing livestock from waterways and providing them with alternative water, be that a well and water troughs or a, a limited access if that's the 
the best thing for that situation. Um, converting row crop ground to hay or pasture land for kind of a long-term cover. Um, annual cover crops, tree plantings, uh, manure storage, especially here in the valley where it's a very livestock heavy environment. Um, you know, we do quite a lot of work with providing appropriate manure storage so that folks are maintaining those nutrients and, and keeping those out of the waterways until they can be utilized appropriately. And um, we do, up here we do a good bit of roof runoff management where we can help people install um, gutters and downspouts on existing barns to keep runoff water out of barnyard areas where nutrients would be carried to ground, um, to surface waters. So kind of the big things about our cost share program and the folks that we can work with, uh, you do have to have a minimum of five acres. And um, we have a $100,000 cost share limit per participant per year. Um, most of our cost share practices provide at least 75% reimbursement. That's kind of a big difference between what we do and what NRCS does, where they pay flat rates for practices. We pay a percentage based on the actual bills that you turn in for installing those practices. Um, one big thing, especially in our area, we have a lot of people leasing land um, and we can work with those folks. We you can certainly sign up if you're the landowner, but we can also work with you if you're renting ground. And we encourage that you have a written lease, but it's not required. We can work with you in whatever situation you're in. Um, you know, as long as you feel like you've got a, a stable situation, most of our practices, um, some of our practices are annual practices or just for one year, like cover crops. Um, but most of our practices are five, 10 or 15 year contracts where you're obligated to maintain the things that you were paid to install. But as long as you feel like you're in a rental situation that's stable, you don't have to have a written lease. You can work with us anyway. Um, it is a competitive process to receive cost share. So we collect applications year round and our fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. So that's a little bit different than the federal programs. Um, but then, you know, like I said, we take applications throughout the year during that time and, and we rank practices and make approvals um, on a monthly basis in our district. And um, so we've got kind of more options for folks that way you can apply at whatever time is appropriate and get that financial assistance or at least compete to get that financial assistance. Um, Next slide, please. Um, another big thing that districts do, which you may or may not know, districts across the state are responsible for quite a lot of flood control dams. So our district operates two dams, which is a lot fewer than some districts, but um, our, dis our district's dams were considered high hazard. And so they were very recently renovated and so we're responsible for um, the maintenance of those structures. Um, ours are in, in a pretty public location back in a resort community. Not all districts dams are, are well known, but every time there's flooding, there's kind of a worry in some districts. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. There you go. Um, we also have, through soil and water, we have urban conservation practices. The Virginia Conservation Assistance Program is a way that we can work with non-agricultural land owners to address stormwater concerns. Um, and so this is residential areas, um, localities can apply for these funds, businesses, those sorts of things. Um, these practices don't have that same five acre requirement that our agricultural practices do. 
So next slide, please. These are some of the um, practices that are included in the VCAP program, rainwater harvesting, conservation landscaping, rain gardens, bioretention. Um, this was just established a couple of years ago. It was first piloted over toward the Charlottesville area and then eventually rolled out um, through the whole Chesapeake Bay watershed. So most of those are there's there's still a 75% a cost share up to a cap on on all of those practices. Next, please. Like I said, another big um, component of district work is education. So like in our district, we work with our local governor schools. Um, we provide we put on an awards banquet to recognize uh, producers every year and, and partners. We work with the state and their uh, Envirothon program, which is a competition for high school students testing their knowledge on natural resource topics. Um, we publish newsletters. We work with um, our local community garden in the town here where our office is located and um, just do lots of outreach through also adult groups, Farm Bureau, and, and things of that nature, just trying to provide uh, conservation education, environmental education, and also um, spreading the word about our programs. Next, please. Like I said, we collaborate um, with a lot of other agencies. We work very closely. Like I said, we're co-located our offices with NRCS and Farm Service Agency, but we also work very closely with Extension and the Department of Forestry, um, things of that nature. So, you know, we're, we're a fairly small organization, um, but through, through us, we can provide help to, to folks by partnering with a lot of these other org organizations. Next, I don't think I have too many other slides. All right, and that's it. Um, and I also neglected to put our phone number on here, but like I said, I'm co-located in the Strasburg Service Center with Brent and Jeanette. So um, we're the same 540-465-2424 phone number. And um, my extension is 110. Uh, but if you dial the office there, you can, you can get to any of us. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Dana, for participating on this uh, Zoom call. Uh, Soil and Water uh, really partners with us a lot. Thank you very much. Um, up next is me, and I also have some coworkers, which uh, Janet Wright from Florida. Uh, Janet, if you just pop in. And we also have Lindsay, it said, I, her, I'm gonna let her pronounce her last name, but she is from Minnesota. So we're gonna talk about urban ag today. So uh, Mark, have you ready to get that slide up? This is a new program that Farm Service Agency just, uh, just offered in the last couple of months. Okay, give me one second. Is this it? Urban ag, Ur yes. Oh, all right. Go. Okay. All right. The second slide. This is a, telling you a little bit about Farm Service Agency, serving American agriculture community for more than over 80 years. Next slide, please. This program, just as I said, this is a new program that we are administering called an Urban Agriculture. Uh, this was in our farm bill, in 2018 farm bill. Uh, this is uh, one of the better programs that we have that's for small producers. Uh, it is led by NRCS and works with partnership with numerous USDA agencies that support urban agriculture. This office will be set up with an advisor committee for the Secretary of Ag, as well as 10 new urban and suburban FSA County committees. 
It will also provide grants and cooperative agreements. This is only in the city of Richmond. I don't want you to know this program is in the city of Richmond at this time. And that office that you will be serviced out of, the committees will be serviced out of that New Kent, which is our Four Rivers District in New Kent County. On August 25th, the office announced the first recipients of this program. So we have the Urban Agriculture Innovative Production Competitive Grants that we have, cooperative agreements. Uh, we had over 500 applications for this grant. Next slide. Okay, tell, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our grant programs. I'm gonna, not gonna read all of these items for the sake of time. Uh, we have uh, at least administer $1.4 million awarded for these three planning projects. And as you see, just as I said, that Richmond, Virginia is uh, one of the areas that will be receiving uh, this urban farm and the grant. So uh, that means that we will be working with producers in the area of Richmond so that they can you know, receive some of the funding if they qualify. And you will see that we have several different other recipients. We have um, Arkansas, uh, Associates of African American Living in Vermont. We have several different states that receive those, that funding, that grant funding. Next slide, please. Urban and suburban county committees, just as I said, on August the 12th, FSA announced the first five of the 10 new urban and suburban FSA county committees and the requested nominees. The next five will be announced later this fall. So you see Richmond, Virginia, just as I said, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Ohio, Portland, Oregon, and Albuquerque, New Mexico were the recipients of those uh, grants. The new committee will, will be in two phases. Uh, you will see we'll establish one now. The committees will be in place for five or more years. So that means that we're in the process of trying to, you know, select names or gather names to have those people elected to the county committees. And these 11 members will serve for three years. Members will be local, uh, urban and suburban farmers who will ensure favorable and equitable administration of FSA programs in the counties and the multi jurisdiction Under the general supervision, the state committee and the eyes and the ears of the urban and the producers uh, who will elect them. Just as I said, the committee represents the priority of urban and suburban farmers. Additionally, the Urban County Committee may address such areas such as food, community agreement, support or local activity, or to promote and encourage community food waste or reduction. Next slide. Why do you want to serve on the Urban Ag Committee? That's a good question for the producers, and I did see some uh, urban farmers on our uh, call today. Urban County Office Committee of board members, just made up of local producers, local farmers, and ranchers. Urban County Office Committee members are elected by the local farmers and ranchers. So you're elected to this committee. Urban County Office re reports urban ag need, meet needs directly to the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. Reports directly to the Secretary of Agriculture. Serving on the committee provides an opportunity to educate fellow producers on USDA programs. Also serving on this committee helps provide an opportunity to make decisions and impact for our local producers. Okay, the new urban and suburban farm service agency committee will play a vital key role on how programs and how our urban farmers or growers meet this in this area include local farmers with ties to urban agriculture, local farmers that have in innovative practices, diversity practices, and includes historical underserved. Just as most of the agency has talked about, this program includes historical underserved farmers. 
will be nominated by peers, such as our committee, typical to include 11 members, just as I said, to serve three years. Next slide, please. Okay, look at our nomination. Now we're gonna talk about the nomination period. FSA will begin accepting nomination for the Urban County Committee. We started on September the 8th and supposed to go through October the 2nd. 2020. Urban farmers will participate in the cooperative and FSA programs and the county is selected. Just as I said, New Kent is one of the counties I believe selected for our Urban Ag Committee. To be considered for this, and if you want your name on the ballot, a producer must sign a 669A form. This is a nomination form. The form and other information are located on our website. So if you're interested in serving on this committee, in which we would like to have some of you to serve on this committee, if you're in the Richmond area, so you will need to request that form from the website. All nomination for the forms must be postmarked and received in the local FSA office by October the 2nd. Election ballots will be mailed to eligible voters beginning October the 23rd. Next slide. Okay, this is just general information about urban farming. Uh, I'm not going to bore you by reading all these items. You will receive a, power, a copy of this PowerPoint if you're interested in receiving it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, just look at some of the urban ag eligible, our nominees uh, eligibility. To hold an office as Urban County Office Committee, a person must fulfill each requirements. And just look at the requirements to be a nominee. You have to be a producer who owns and operates a farm or ranch. To hold, you be a producer who participates and contributes in a nonprofit entity or organization. Participate or cooperate in any farm service agency programs provided for by law. Must be at least 18 years of age and resides or live in the jurisdiction they will be serving. Next slide, please. Okay, that's just some information on how to contact the FSA if you're interested in doing in uh, serving on one of these committees. Next slide, please. Okay, this is my contact information. Uh, I'm gonna ask Janet, uh, Ada Lindsay, just to pop in and give me a little highlights on some things that I may have missed about five minutes for each, or three to five minutes for each, and then to close our Zoom meet now. Janice, uh, Ada Lindsay. Okay, well, I, this is Janet Wright, and I will just um, I will just um, go over um, what D what Diane said. This is a great opportunity for those in those urban areas who have not um, to date really participated in our programs or have participated in our programs but want more of a voice on how they are administered in those areas. This would be a great opportunity to get involved. And this would give you an opportunity to not only learn the programs and how the programs are administered, you would have a voice on how it is administered at the urban area level because um, farming is a little different in these, um, in these areas, uh, depending on hoop houses and small area acreages and those types of things. So this would be a great opportunity to um, be involved in getting um, these programs to recognize how it specifically um, affects urban areas. And um, right now, I would like to just open it up to see if anyone has any questions. I guess you could put the questions in the chat box. Okay, Diane, I guess I can turn it back over to you. 
Thank you very much, Janet. Thank you for being on the call today, all the way from Florida. I appreciate your assistance. Uh, Mark and uh, Michael, uh, we would like to thank you all very much for allowing uh, USDA and other agencies to be a part of this wonderful Zoom meeting. But I just want to thank you all so much. And if you do have questions, you're welcome to contact or reach out to any of our other presenters, and we'll be able to get you a copy of the presentation if you need a copy of the presentation. Mark, is there anything else that we will that you would like for us to discuss before we close out? Uh, just to let you know that this will be on our YouTube channel uh, within about two weeks or so, we hope. If you just go to YouTube and you type in uh, v, VSU College of Agriculture, you should see it on there. We have to get it captioned and everything, and, and especially the longer videos, it takes a while to get them done. Thank you, Mark. Um, Michael Carter Jr., are you on today to close us out? Um, either Marilyn Estes. Oh. Well, I want to thank everybody for staying on and being a part and receiving this great information and hope that we can uh, participate in as many of these programs as possible. Uh, the urban agriculture opportunities are very new and exciting. A lot of new opportunities there. Uh, again, we welcome you uh, and appreciate you spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, we look forward to having more programming in the coming weeks and months uh, to continue to offer this information to you. Okay, will the slides be available? Yes, we'll make the uh, presentations available and then they'll also be available on the website. So I'll work to send those out uh, early next week. Okay, thank you very much. And Michael, thank you very much for your time and Mark for your time also. We, are, we will have another Zoom meeting on September the 24th at 10 o'clock and that will be administered out of the Greenville County office. So we're looking forward to some of the USDA presenters to be back on the call September 24th at 10 o'clock. Derek Clagg will be the small outreach agent that will be working with that program and Mark and also Mike. So thank you all very much for participating and continue on with your day. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>